morning, everyone. Everyone learning lots at BET. Just in case you haven't connected to the Wi-Fi, you do have free Wi-Fi. You'll just have to register on the page. And if you're on Twitter, please do tweet. It is hashtag BET2020. And I'm your host, Isam. I'm a lecturer here in London. And it gives me great pleasure, really, to introduce this session. And it's such an important, important session. And I think that's why we have a, a, a packed house today. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Dawn here, and she'll be chairing this panel discussion. So join me in a round of applause in welcoming them. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for coming along this morning. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce our panel. We have Ben Commons, who's head teacher at Queen's Park Primary and a mental health first aid trainer for teachers. Kelly, who is wellbeing associate at Lessness Heath Primary School, and Richard Faulkner, who's head of policy and research at Education Support Partnership. Um, in this half hour, we're going to try and look at sort of mental health, the why, the how, and the so what. Now, that's quite a broad topic that's in the news a lot at the moment, and we only have half an hour. So, first, why? If we look at the teacher statistics, um, hopefully you're all aware of Ed Support Partnership and the fantastic work they do. And every year they publish a report looking into teacher well-being in the UK. And as you can see from the stats, it doesn't make great reading. So, Richard, if I can come to you first, can you just talk us through the figures and the key findings about teacher well-being at the moment? Yes, absolutely. Um, so we do this report annually in partnership with YouGov. Uh, and I think the biggest trend we've seen over the last few years has been relating to uh, work-related stress. And we've seen steady increase over the last three years in that. And also um, teachers and school staff experiencing things such as tearfulness, difficulty concentrating, difficulty sleeping, and irritability. We've seen steady rises across the last three years. 2019 was also the first year for um, over a third of education professionals experienced a mental health issue. Um, and we also saw an increase in terms of uh, staff who had gone to their GP and been formally diagnosed with anxiety, depression, acute stress. Um, amongst the sort of wider workforce, um, we know over three quarters um, experienced some um, sort of behavioral, psychological, or physical symptoms as a result of their work. Um, and just to put that into wider context, the CIPR um, did some work, so CIPD did some work um, in terms of looking at this across the wider workforce, and they found that 60% experienced these symptoms. So we know that it's disproportionate within education and disproportionate amongst education staff. Um, and the net result of this is for those who experience symptoms, over half said that they would consider leaving education within the past two years. Um, and some of the key reasons we saw for that was around the volume of workload. Um, but a new one which has really come to light the last few years has been around the lack of trust um, and also poor student behavior. So these are some of the themes we're seeing. Um, and this very much correlates with what we're seeing as a charity um, in the helplines we run. Uh, we've had over, managed over 14,000 cases last year um, through those helplines. And we're seeing a big increase in not just the number of co calls and cases we're dealing with, but also the severity of the cases. Um, so we find that teachers are not getting help at an early stage, but they're, they're waiting till they reach a crisis. Um, and a large part of that is their commitment to the children in the workplace. But we know in the long run, um, it's not having a positive effect. Um, and we, last year, we dealt with an average of two callers a day who were clinically assessed to be at risk of suicide by our accredited counselors. So that shows you the sort of far end of the spectrum that um, this situation is dealing with. Um, the one thing I should add, though, is that within the report, we saw a lot of good examples where um, working in school and teaching had a really positive impact on people's mental health and well-being. Um, but obviously, the trends we're also seeing are quite alarming and need to be addressed. So not necessarily a positive start um, on the sort of teacher workload, but it's not just the teachers that are suffering. Um, the last report that NHS published showed that 12.8% of 5 to 19 year olds um, had a mental disorder. So Ben, if I can come to you, are you seeing this reflected in school with the children that you're working with as well? Yeah, um, going back to what uh, uh, Richard said, when I first became a head teacher, I thought it would be about teaching and learning, um, and it's not. It is, but 
large parts of my job was taken up with actually looking at people's well-being and what we could do to support their well-being. Um, I, would, I would guess that these percentages are an underestimate of what, what the real figure is. And the reason why I would say that is because there's often misdiagnosis, um, a fear of discrimination, um, a lack of understanding. But it's definitely reflected in, I'm, I'm across four schools, and it's definitely reflected across, across these four schools. So probably the question is, is how can we help and what can we do and what can we learn from sort of the panel that we can put back into practice? So Kelly, can you talk us through the approach that you use at Lessons Heath? Yeah, as a school, um, we put well-being at the heart of all we do. It underpins the foundations of everything that we do and that in turn looks after the learning. So this process starts with releasing the stigma around talking about mental health and giving our stakeholders the understanding and knowledge to be able to explore their needs. Part of that process is, has been developed through me creating a rigorous identification process. And what that does is we take pupil voice, we capture that data and analyze it and put it in a rag rating system. So we're able to see our families and children who need much needed preventative support, which includes quality first teaching, early help and specialist supervision. This has had a huge impact on our school community. We not only collect data from our students, we also collect data from our teachers and from our local community and our parents. And what that does, that helps us create a framework that builds strategies and action plans and we constantly go back and revisit them and ensure that we're keeping up with the changing times and the trends of needs. We have a four-tiered approach, and what that's done is effectively impact the outcome for our referral systems. All of our CAMS referrals have been accepted in the last year, and we currently have secured three EHCP plans for three of our children for SEMH needs. And that's because of our um, identification process and the evidence that we can use to show that we've given quality intervention to all of our pupils. Thanks. And um, if I go to Ben, you mentioned something about being across four schools. Kelly mentioned the four-pronged approach. Can you just sort of talk the audience through about how you help the children that you work with across the schools? Um, again, going back to what uh, Kelly said and having that uh, four-pronged approach, um, we do something very similar because our stakeholders really are our, our children, our staff, our community and our families. And one of the things we were really, really passionate about is actually getting an equal footing and a, a, a good foundation for, for children to build upon. Um, when we looked at our, our, our staff, um, how could I possibly ask a staff member to stand in front of a class and give 100% if, they, if I wasn't looking after their well-being? We looked within, we looked at structures. Um, I have the lovely Stella um, over there who's a cognitive behaviour therapist within our school. Um, but that wasn't the journey that Stella had, had started on, but it's a journey that she's now developed and grown within the school. So our children, our families, our community have that access to a cognitive behavior therapist all the time. When we think about the children, we wanted to give the children pathways to happiness. How do we give children pathways to happiness? We wanted to be proactive and not reactive. So again, that brought us back to our structures and what are we doing to be proactive? That brought us onto our mental health first aid. And it, at the moment, we've trained nearly just over 300 people to be mental health first aiders, all of our staff team. Because to be proactive, we needed to be able to recognize the signs and symptoms within the children so that we could do something about it and signpost them. Um, our families, our, our children only spend 50% of their waking time at, at the school. The other 50% is spent with their families. So what were we doing to support the families? How were we helping them? Because we know if we were sending the children back to an environment that wasn't conducive to their learning, wasn't conducive to their well-being, um, we, we were swimming against the tide. So again, we wanted to make sure that we could signpost, we could support and we could, we could look after the whole family unit. And finally, for us, it was about the community. Because as I said earlier about the fear of discrimination um, and breaking down those stigmas, 
um, uh, we needed to do something to actually enlighten people and educate people to it's okay not to be okay. Um, mental health is, is fluid, it's on a continuum, and anything in life at any point um, will affect our mental health. So going back to again, and I know, I've, I know Kelly and I know her well, um, it's similar approaches that have worked extremely well because what we're trying to do is, is look at the whole unit, the whole community, put mental health aid, aiders into the community, um, support the families, support the children, and support, most importantly, our staff. Um, because I think it's Richard Branson who, who, who famously said, if you look after your staff, the rest will follow. Um, and I think there's real, real power in that, that actually look after your staff and you're on, you're on to a winning start. Um, and if, I think, if we think about the staff, particularly in the press at the moment, um, mental health and well-being is obviously a hot topic. And very often when you talk about teacher well-being, you might have seen yoga sessions or um, being told that director time is to come along for this so you can talk about your well-being. When actually as a teacher, you might want to just get on with your marking and your planning that you have to do instead of going to a well-being session. So Richard, could you talk through kind of how Ed Support Partnership, what you recommend for how teachers and senior leaders can actually support their staff in a meaningful way and not just provide lip service to kind of the mental health and well-being umbrella? Yeah, well, I think it's an incredibly important point, I think, for you raised and Ben raised in terms of, unfortunately, there's no silver bullet when it comes to, you know, staff mental health. Mental health is complex. It's, um, it can be a, the result of some, an issue going on in someone's personal life as well as their professional life. Um, and again, as, as Dawn mentioned, you know, there's some really well-meaning senior leaders out there in schools with the best intentions who are putting in place additional activities when actually we know from things like the Teacher Wellbeing Index and from speaking to staff that actually volume of workload is one of the biggest work-related factors which is contributing to stress. So um, you're almost adding to that. So it, it's about reducing unnecessary tasks. I think it's about, um, you know, as uh, Kelly touched on earlier, one of the big pieces of work we're doing as a charity is we've conducted, I think, over 103,000 um, positive workplace surveys across England over the last seven years. Um, and they're based around the health and safety executive um, management standards for stress. And, and, and what we see from that, from analysing that data in the early stages, is that things like, you know, relationships, control over workloads, demands by managers, um, culture of the school. These are really the key drivers we're seeing are impacting on staff mental health um, and well-being. And that's where, where I think senior leaders need additional support from incredibly demanding to be able to um, focus on uh, going forward. So I think that's really important. Um, but in a way, and I know this is going to sound a little bit odd, uh, so what? Um, schools are under a lot of pressure, both with budgets, um, Ofsted with their deep dives um, and having to be aware of lots of subjects. You've got your SATs, the testing regime. Um, so, so why? So why should schools put mental health and well-being at kind of their heart? Why should it matter? Um, so, you know, Richard, you talked about what schools can do, but why should schools make this a priority? Um, and what does the research tell us that if they, if schools put mental health and well-being at the heart of everything they do, what is the impact, and why should they do it? Well, I think first up, I think um, you know, within we, we know a lot around you know emotional development from a child perspective, but actually, we often forget that teaching is an incredibly physically, emotionally, psychologically demanding job. Um, and if you actually look at the support systems which are um, available to other people, such as social workers or nurses, um, they've got an awful lot of support around that. And actually, that's not really fully acknowledged within education. Um, so I think that's an important first step in just making that, that very clear. Um, I think in terms of what the research is telling us, in terms of the, 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 the so what, um, that there's been a number of studies recently which sort of look at the link between teacher well-being and teacher mental health and things such as um, pupil well-being. Uh, there's a really big study in secondary schools by the University of Bristol through um, the WISE project. If you, look, if you look that up, it's a really, really interesting study. And they show a really strong association between teacher well-being and pupil well-being. Um, Professor Jonathan Glazard, who's one of the leading academics in this area, he coins the phrase, you know, if a teacher has poor mental health, 
it spreads like a virus through the classroom. Um, so again, there's, there is a growing evidence base that's showing the link between these things. Um, and also, I think, you know, we look back to things like the Teacher Wellbeing Index. We've got a very disproportionate level of stress. You've got 10 million children and young people spending a l large part of their life in quite stressful environments. Um, and that's not going to be good for their, you know, their learning, their attainment, and their emotional development. So I think these are, are really important things. You know, yeah. and I think also actually just, you know, I think last year there was 2.2 million sick days for teachers, um, 4,000 off on long-term stress leave. Um, and within the 2.2 million figure, we saw quite a big increase in terms of stress. Um, it was the biggest factor which went up out of all the illnesses. Um, and I think the final thing just to add is, you know, we're, we're currently in a recruitment and retention crisis with teachers. And it, we need to invest in their mental health, their well-being, and encourage them to stay. Because if you look at the stats from you know, 2011 compared to current day, we're now losing a third of early career teachers inside their first five years. So I think you know, the so what, it, it's becoming imperative, I think. Yeah, so the so what, you keep your teachers. You also cut down your lack of teachers, the sick pay, all of those knock-on costs. Um, ben, as a head, um, very often your job comes down to your latest Ofsted report, sadly, your SATS results. Um, so a lot of heads focus on the English, the maths, the year six. Why, why have you put mental health and well-being at the focus of your four schools and not focused on what maybe traditional school leaders might have focused on? Um, that's a good question. Um, we, we work in, a, in an environment that's, um, that's rife with accountability. Um, and I would argue that that accountability and the stresses that are, are put upon teachers because of that accountability um, is, is counterproductive to, to getting the best out of your staff team, uh, the best results you could possibly get. Um, when I talk about getting the best results you can possibly get, I'm not just talking about our SATS results. I'm talking about the child's well-being. What do we want for our children? Well, for me, I want a child to leave the school. I want them to be happy and I want them to have these transferable skills for jobs that currently don't exist. So how do I go about doing that? And what we try to do is we try to create a growth mindset. And our growth mindset was about, if I give you an example, if you put me in a classroom with 30 athletes and you were comparing me against those athletes, I'd feel like a failure. Um, there's no comparison, they're athletes, it's what they do. But if you put me in a classroom with 30 athletes and I was given 100% and your, your, the way you spoke to me and your reward mechanism of, you know what, Ben, you've tried really hard and I can see that you've improved. I'm going to have that in, intrinsic drive and want to constantly improve myself. And that takes a massive shift. I'm not saying these are things you can do straight away. We've been on this journey for nearly six years. And talking of results, Dawn, this is the first time we've seen our reception and take them all the way through to year six. Um, and we're in the top 3% of the country. And my school's in an area where we're in the top percentile for deprivation, we're in the top percentile for free school meals, we have 80% EAL. So this hasn't happened by chance. It's happened because I've got good teachers. But good teachers stay because you value what they do. When that teacher comes to me and says, you know what, Ben, I want to speak to you about something, it's so important, little things. Turn away from your computer, face that person, and give them your attention. Because that might be the first time they've actually come to you and really opened up and said, can we have a conversation? So simple things, such as turning away from your computer and giving uh, uh, staff, pupils, families, the community the time that they deserve. Um, and like I said, we're in a system which is the accountability and the stakes are really, really high. So we looked at growth mindset. What do we want for these children? How do we get there? We looked within, we looked at structures. We looked at investing in people. And then we looked at pathways. I said it before, pathways to happiness. So from that was born uh, Westminster Children University, which uh, Lindsay has taken a, a lead on. And last year, I was really proud of that. We gave children 33 and a half thousand extra curricular hours of activities. Now that's not necessarily educational hours, that's somewhere to go after school that means you can spend time with your family for free. This year I believe it's nearly 60,000 hours um, 
extracurricular on top of what we're already giving. So, and you spoke about recruitment and retention, and we we have pretty much zero um, uh, turnover. Our staff rarely leave. We had one leave this year, and we had 88 job applicants. Now there is a recruitment problem, but. The reason why that we had such a, a high number of applicants, I personally believe is because of our open door policy, because I'm willing to sit there and say, right, tell me what's wrong. And not, uh, don't ask once, ask three times. Apparently there's some research around asking the same question three times, you're more likely to get the answer that you're looking for. But you, that, for that to happen, you've not got to be scared of somebody coming in and saying, why are your results like that? Because actually, they're professionals, they work really hard, and, and giving them the time and the space, looking at their workloads, um, to make sure that they can be as productive as they, as, as they possibly can. Infest, infest in people. Cry with them, laugh with them, enjoy the time with them. It's, there's no one science to this, but it is about actually making sure that I'm looking after Dawn, I'm looking after Kelly, I'm looking after Richard, and they're looking after me. My staff team, coming all the time because this six pack isn't by accident and my staff team come in all the time and they make sure they say to me what are you having for lunch and they make sure it's not a bag of monster munch they make sure that i'm drinking water they follow constantly filling up my water bottle and i do the same for them and it really is about making sure that you're there for each other because yes teaching and learning is so important i've had six years of trying to drive this through and i'm happy for you to to look at our results and I do believe that part and parcel of that is because I've managed to keep teachers, we've invested in them, we've invested in the community, families, pupils, so we're trying to level the playing field. Yeah, thanks, Ben. And I think the results really do speak for themselves, that since they started on the wellbeing track, where they are in the percentage of schools nationally. Um, but as Ben said, schools don't act in isolation. Schools are part of the community, and I think mental health and well-being can't just exist in schools. We've got to support our families, and I know Kelly at Lettonest, and with you as the well-being associate, you've set up sort of parent groups, helping support parents. So can you give us a sort of a quick overview that people in the audience yeah. might be able to take away of how you've engaged with the wider community? Brilliant. Like Ben was saying, it's about unlocking potential. Every child and family should have the right to flourish, no matter what adversities they've been faced with in their life. So part of my journey um, at Lesnes Heath was the school was in special measures when I was initially invited in. So there was a real breakdown of a positive culture and relationships. So connectivity is the driver behind my wellbeing strategies. So it's about being present and being open and being able to release the shame on some of these situations that these families have been born into and stopping that repeated cycle of events. So what I did was I cr created a programme called the Family Matters Programme. And what that is, it's initially an empowerment programme that enables parents to look at themselves as being the product of their environment. So often parents can only bring to the table the ex uh, their own experiences that their own parenting capacity is inflicted on them. So what I do is I give them the understanding and the knowledge and the chance to be the change within their families. This is led and run um, by the parents. I've had over 50% of our school community engage with this programme with outstanding outcomes. And what that looks like is we've been able to get families off long-term safeguarding plans and keep them off them. They're actually flourishing. One example of that was a family that I was working with where the relationships were completely broken down and the mum actually um, was able to identify that she was really struggling to like her own daughter. So I worked systemically within the family. So what that looked like was the mum would come into the Family Matters programme and she would learn about hot topics around mental health, emotional coaching, and then I was working consistently with the child under a play therapy remit. The outcome of that was that recently I attended a roundtable event at Westminster and both that mother and child were together feeling incredibly proud and at the end of that meeting they said that that opportunity was life-changing. As educators, we really do have the potential to help families have the best outcomes in life. But what we need to get better at is looking after ourselves. 
I know as a wellbeing consultant, so often my own wellbeing is placed at the back of the queue whilst I'm serving others a diet of wellbeing. So what I'm really interested in, in thinking about today is what can we do to safeguard ourselves as professionals to be able to go on and do the incredible job that we do. Wellbeing should be for every day, for everyone. So let's keep that message alight and take that with us on our journey today. Um, but there is help out there. So on the screen are several organisations that I use when I was a deputy head in schools, and I know that people on the panel. Can I just see a show of hands if you've heard of at least three of the organisations on the board? OK, so now you've got a lot of organisations that kind of you can take away. And we've got five minutes left. So it's going to be a bit of a challenge, but I'm going to try and do a whistle-stop one-minute overview um, of the charities on the board. And I'm going to start off with the one just above my head. Um, and that's the Charlie Waller Memorial Trust. When I was a deputy head um, in East London about six years ago, there wasn't really much help out there for mental health and well-being. Charlie Waller Memorial Trust were amazing. So they run workshops in school. It's a charity. They'll send out brochures that you can give out at parents' evening. So I found it really helpful that if we had parents' evening, I'd have a stall in the hall to talk about mental health, well-being, how we could support. Um, they also do a mental health and well-being book club. So they'll send a book out to you, review it as a senior leader, share it with your staff, engaging them in their learning. Um, Richard, I'm obviously going to come to you to talk about educated support. Um, can I just see a show of hands if you're a teacher or an educator in the UK? Can you just put your hand up? Okay. Can you keep your hand up if you'd already heard about Ed Support Partnership? One minute off to you, Richard. <laughs> um, so as I said at the start, we'd, um, we've been going all various guises for about 140 years. Um, we started off as a teacher's benevolent fund and we now uh, do a lot of work in sort of mental health and well-being for staff uh, across England, Wales and across the UK. Um, I think the one thing I'd try and get you to take home is the helpline number. Um, it's staffed by BACP accredited counsellors 24-7-365. Um, it's 08562 561. Anyone working in education can get up to six sessions of uh, structured counselling, um, coaching. There's a range of other services you can get through that from the charity. Um, and we also work in over 800 schools across England and Wales. Um, and there's more information on all the and stuff we can yeah, do. Yeah, and am I right, if you go to the website, staff can also download posters that yeah. they can put up yeah. in staff because it is a free counselling service 24-7. So it's a really important message to get that out. Um, Kelly, are you going to yeah. talk about Anna Freud? Yeah, the Anna Freud um, was initially set up by Seaman Freud's granddaughter, Anna Freud, and it's a fantastic service for anyone working within education. They have lots of different support available. I would highly recommend signing up to their Schools in Mind network, and there you will find lots of animations, lesson plans, which will save time for your teachers. It's a quality um, space to collect resources and information. They also have other services attached to that. So the On My Mind service has been created to give the voice to young people to have ownership over their support for their own mental health, what they want it to look like and what they want their goals to be. Um, also within that, you will uh, be able to call them at any time and visit their centre um, in Islington in London. But there's a lots of information, so familiarise yourself with that site um, and take that information back and share it widely within your school communities. Um, and also, a lot of the resources on there are also free, lots of toolkits, lots of videos for both engaging with staff and parents. Ben, um, Heads Together Mentally Healthy Schools? Yep. Um, again, I've used um, all five support networks on the board. Um, the Mentally Healthy Schools, one of the things that I found really useful when I was using it was the headspace and the promotion of headspace for myself. It made me think about actually what am I doing for myself, take, how am I taking care of myself, who am I talking to. Um, it gave us strategies to be able to do that. It gave us a network to work within different schools and reach out and share best practice. Um, and it made us really look at our structures because what was important for me is are our structures within our school supportive of, of the four prongs I spoke about earlier. Um, and really important as well is if you're an educator in the UK, US and Canada, the Headspace app is actually free. 
um, all you need to do is register with the school address. And again, I could, I've just seen raised eyebrows, um, which is great because not many teachers know about it. But again, that's something else to take back and share. Um, Young Minds, uh, another fantastic charity. So they do the Wear Yellow campaign in October for Mental Health Day. And again, I've got free resources. So all of these charities that we've mentioned are there to support schools. And hopefully, we've signposted them to you. Um, can I just take this opportunity to thank you very much for coming along to this session this morning. Um, what I will say is obviously I'm on Too Simple, we're on Stand NG50, we're going to be there afterwards with the whole panel if you've got any questions. We've also got a free wellbeing pack that you can download with all the links to the charities and some lesson plans to save you time in school. Um, if you could join me in thanking Ben, Kelly and Richard for their time this morning. Um, thank you once again for coming along and have a good day at the show. Thank you very much. <laughs>